And I think you drew a really important distinction there that I just wanted to reiterate and emphasize, which is that there's a very distinct difference between the external physiological state and your interior experience of that. And working with this technology is a nexus of both. It's the place where these two things meet, where we're working with the exteriors to affect your experience, which of course you'll interpret differently depending on a variety of factors. Welcome to Infinite Conversations. My name is Marco Morelli, and my guest in this episode is Douglas Prater. Doug is an author, musician, media engineer, and designer of audio tracks that offer support for meditation, flow states, and personal development work. In this episode, we discuss how audio brainwave entrainment technology can be used to cultivate consciousness, mental health, and creativity, especially when used in the context of a holistic or integral practice. Specifically, we discuss Doug's latest creation, Stealing Flow, a suite of tracks designed to support the creative cycle by inducing phase-appropriate flow states. The conversation includes an overview of the major brainwave states, as well as the flow cycle, and discusses how stealing flow works to enhance our creative capacity by entraining ourselves to these various states. Doug and I also shared notes about how we've personally used meditation and brainwave tech as part of our creative process, and Doug talks about his recent sci-fi and romance writing, as well as his upcoming book about Harry Potter and Buddhism. I also want to let you know that Infinite Conversations is now on Open Collective, where you can become a backer of this show and our forum for as little as $2 a month. If you like Infinite Conversations and want to see us continue and grow and thrive, then please consider becoming a supporter. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, and without further ado, here's Douglas Prater. Thanks, Marco. I'm uh, really grateful for your, your invitation to be here today and looking forward to everything that we have to s- discuss. There's so much richness in all of this territory. Um, technology is such a powerful way to facilitate creation of art, and art itself is a powerful way to facilitate conscious evolution. All these things go hand in hand together in such a beautiful and, and interconnected way. I'm I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be doing this with my life. It's been something that has fascinated me for so long. I remember uh, as a music major in college and studying sound engineering in particular, um, it was about the same time that I discovered meditation for the first time. And immediately I went to go search for music for meditation and discovered the idea of brainwave entrainment. There was an immediate attraction there and an immediate facilitation. It's a journey that has continued to deepen as I have explored other uses for it as well and has led some pretty interesting directions in my life and in my work that I feel truly blessed to be able to go in. Mm. I'd like to share then as well, like part of my personal experience with, with or relationship to the technology because I've been using and part of the reason I wanted to talk with you is because uh, I've been using uh, brainwave entrainment tech for well over a decade uh, and have uh, worked specifically and extensively with the I Awake uh, tracks uh, that, um, you know, you've contributed one, but there have, other, there have been other uh, sound designers or meditation track designers who've uh, also uh, worked with the company, Eric Thompson, Javi Otero, uh, and, and others. And I have been a participant in the in the business as a with my wife as web developers. We were we we designed the first iWake uh, website uh, way back when, uh, and so I've always had access to the tech, and it's always been a part. Not always, but for the last you know ten years or so, it's been a part of my life, and I have always used it with for meditation, but also for writing uh, because mm-hmm. those those practices are really tied together. The sound technology just the meditation with or without the sound technology. And then the writing process or the creative process have always been very closely tied together uh, for me since college, actually, when I, when I began meditating, I did it at, in order to gain some clarity within myself to be able to communicate what I felt was within me that I, you know, I had to get out in some way. And so I've been very, felt very thankful uh, that I've gotten to use this. And, you know, at the same time, uh, there is a lot, there are, you know, many 
uh, questions we could ask around how it really works and um, what are the different use cases? Uh, how do different tracks work? How do this, you know, what are the, what is the part that you have to play as a participant? And what does the technology do? Uh, so I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about how specifically you use this tech in your life. Yeah, well, uh, initially it was as an aid to my meditation. Um, I was just looking for something really to help me get to deeper sp states um, in a reliable way. Uh, when you start getting into creative practice, it's fairly commonly recommended advice to try some meditation beforehand to help get yourself into that space. And I do think that part of that lies in the power of ritual itself. Um, I just read a study fairly recently about the ability of ritual to, in particular, uh, release your performance anxiety. And that's why you see it so commonly in, for example, professional athletes or other top performers, actors uh, going on stage coming to mind, comes to mind as well. Um, meditation, though, is more than just a ritual in that it allows you to access those deeper places within yourself. I think that it's so easy to be cut off from deeper dimensions and things that you want to say. I remember specifically for me, I knew for a long time that I had something that I wanted to say to the world, but I had trouble putting my finger on exactly what that was and exactly how I wanted to convey it. Leaning into the meditation helped me access a different part of my consciousness that cleared some of those things up and allowed me to write it. Um, specifically, we talk about going into the theta state, which is where you really start to disconnect from your external consciousness and get really intimate with what's going on inside you. In information comes together in ways that it doesn't normally. And I found that to be an incredibly powerful practice for brainstorming and coming up with ideas. Um, when I get stuck on things, getting out of the normal linear patterns of thinking is often a great way to do that. And using the technology to facilitate those theta states, for example, um, has really transformed my ability to get my head around some of these things and, and come up with ideas that I would never have been able to come up with if I were trying to think about it in a more structured way. Mm -hmm. could, could we talk about maybe you uh, give a primer on states uh, of consciousness and how they relate to brainwaves and then how that relates to the, the tech? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is one of the areas that's just fascinating to me. Uh, again, it was way back in college when I first started learning about this stuff and learning about brainwaves as they relate to meditation. And essentially, in brainwave terms, there are four common and well-known brainwave states. Really, there are a couple more on the top end, the higher frequency range, and a couple more on the bottom end or lower frequency range. But we'll stick with the main four. In your normal day-to-day -day waking consciousness where you're engaged with the physical world and thinking linearly and uh, engaged in the prefrontal cortex kind of rational way that we normally interact with the world, hopefully, most of us anyway, um, it's called the beta state. And there we're in a consciousness spectrum of 14 through about 30 cycles per second. What this means is that different areas of your brain are sending electrical signals at a pulse that is happening 14 to 30 times a second. And as you lower your brain waves down, those pulses slow down and that gives access, gives rise to different states of consciousness. Um, the next one below that is the alpha range of brain waves. That's 13 through about eight is the lower end cutoff there. And this is the place where you're relaxed. Maybe you're daydreaming. Um, it's easy to get into alpha when you close your eyes, relax your muscles. And this is for a lot of people where you begin to access med in meditation. Uh, the relaxation response is triggered and you move into uh, the different parts of your neuroanatomy that allow access to the things that you aren't normally thinking of. Um, your 
blood pressure is lowered a little bit, you engage the parasympathetic nervous system that starts to calm you down. And being into that place kind of counterintuitively can start to enhance performance as well as you're applying it to doing activities like writing or musicianship or going on stage to give a presentation. Um, it's, it's a deliberate relaxation that mm-hmm. happens in alpha state. Uh, below that is theta. This is most often found in dream sleep, in REM sleep. Um, again, it's this internal world of sensory image where you start to lose touch with the physical reality around you and things are often nonlinear, disjointed, um, depending on other kinds of work you've done, you can start to connect to incredibly vivid imagery, um, whether that's visual or auditory or for some folks kinesthetic or any of your other senses. And then below that is the delta brainwave state, which is most often found in deep dreamless sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, Very experienced meditators can often get down into this theta range and some very important work can happen there. Um, Others, and this is really pretty rare to get to naturally, can get down into the lowest, the delta brainwave range while remaining conscious. And in terms of states of consciousness, this is often associated with the causal plane or formless awareness of essentially nothing. And there's some deep spiritual realizations that can happen there. So let, let, let me just make sure we like we kind of set this up because brainwaves is a measurable phenomenon. It's something that you can use a device like an EEG, right? Uh, right. To, EEG is the most common. To, to detect and, and, and to measure. And those brainwave states, those ranges that you described uh, from beta to alpha to theta to delta. And I know that there are a couple of others too, like gamma, sort of mm-hmm. beyond that. Maybe that would be for part two or something. Um, <laughs> But those are correlated with interior kinds of experience. Uh, the kind of waking, going about your day, doing things, mental sort of mode, the um, more relaxed flow state of, non, of sort of non-self uh, a reflective or non-self kind of grasping uh, movement through activities. So you can be an alpha, maybe dancing or talking as we are now. And then below that, the theta, which is dream state, subtle experiences, uh, nonlinear, uh, perhaps uh, magic type experiences or what would be associated with magic consciousness, magical consciousness, where things get exchanged, meaning is fluid, our, our very embodiment is, is fluid as it is in, in the dream state. And then the delta to review being that void, that causal formlessness, that space of deep dreamless sleep, which... Uh, is very, very calm <laughs> and uh, where there isn't so much of a sense of the, the egoic self or the contracted self. And uh, of course, meditation by itself is a practice of cultivating these states, right? Uh, at least that's one way of interpreting it in each tradition or lineage will describe it a little bit differently and have its own sort of metaphysics uh, around that. But looking at it from a more scientific point of view, uh, which is not to invalidate those metaphysical points of views. It's just to, you know, speak in a, la- a, a, a common language. Uh, we are, um, you know, we're, we're talking about neuro, physio, psychic uh, feeling state changes in ourselves. And what, ha- what you are doing is, to, is using, basically using the brainwaves as a kind of handle, right? Sort of, mm-hmm. the, because you're not directly affecting the interior states, but you're, you're getting a handle on them through manipulating, <laughs> perhaps, um, or that might not be the right word for it, but, but in training, really is the word you would use, I think, um, in training those states through that handle. So how specifically is that, is that done? That um, is something that there are a number of different ways to do, but uh, what you're talking about, and I think you drew a really important distinction there that I just wanted to reiterate and emphasize, which is that there's 
a very distinct difference between the external physiological state and your interior experience of that. And working with this technology is a nexus of both. It's the place where these two things meet, where we're working with the exteriors to affect your experience, which of course you'll interpret differently depending on a variety of factors. Um, but the way we entrain primarily is through sound, through the use of sound. There's a well-documented phenomenon called the frequency following response in which a regular repeated stimulus, and this can be visual, it can be aural. Um, aural obviously is uh, what we do with the music and, and the brainwave entrainment. It's the easiest to do and the most popular. And by easiest, I mean, it's the easiest to use on a regular basis because it can be difficult to stare at flashing lights for too long. But um, a regular repeated stimulus. Now, a lot of it is done through what they call a binaural beat is one of the forms of this. And there are several different between binaural beats, monaural beats, and what we call isochronic tones. And the blending of these modalities creates your experience of it. But what we do is we create signals that match the frequency of these experiential brainwave states that we're trying to create and present that signal in such a way that the brains can, that our brains can latch onto it and entrain to it. In the case of a binaural beat, let's say I would like to get into a relaxed 10 hertz alpha state. I put a tone in this ear that is 210 hertz. I put a tone in this ear that is 200 hertz. Now with earphones on, there's nothing physically happening in the space between, but the auditory signals coming into each ear are mixed by my brain who in its attempt to reconcile this close difference of frequencies will generate a beat pattern of 10 hertz now this does a couple of things for us first it creates that repeated stimulus that our brains will entrain to and then create in ourselves the effects of that particular meditative state but it also forces both of our hemispheres to work together. And so we get a combination of our more linear, logical, uh, I'm going to say left brain, but really it's the dominant hemisphere because some people are reversed, but of your linear hemisphere and your intuitive hemisphere. And bridging the gap between those in the corpus callosum is another powerful way to access dimensions of yourself that we don't normally depend on and thus broaden the information that we are able to work with consciously. Mm. Yeah, one way I understand that is in terms of coherence, is bringing the two hemispheres into coherence with one another. And what's interesting about the, the brainwave entrainment process is that uh, you're introducing a disturbance, right, to, into mm -hmm. the brain. It's this kind of dissonance, actually, right? Because you have one pattern uh, pulsating in one, um, toward one side of the brain, another mm -hmm. toward the other, and you're, in a sense, I guess, forcing the brain to kind of reconcile them. And that process of reconciliation can be t attuned. It could be sort of fine-tuned by the differential between... Uh, those two hemispheres. And so the brain is what, what it seems to be trying to do and what the entrainment process is teaching it, I think, to do is to um, relate to dissonance in, in, a, in a way that leads towards resolution in some sense. But it's not a static thing, right? I mean, this is right. the other, I think, dimension of it um, is that it's a flow, right? And so that's part of why you call your tracks stealing the flow <laughs> Because it's a it's a flow it's a co it's a coherent flow state. It's like yeah you know, uh, when something is musical or when something is um, aesthetic. Uh, there is this quality to it that is uh, pleasing uh, and that is uh, that cultivates uh, certain ex maybe modes of expression, uh, information streams. We talk about how you get different kinds of information in the dream state or in the theta state than you may in an alpha state. So uh, can we talk a little bit about flow and, and how that yeah. works and what that means and why, why you're really working with that, with that phenomenon? 
Yeah, so the flow state in particular, um, it's something that most people have experienced at least at some point in their life. Um, you'll hear it referred to by different terms like being in the zone or certain meditative states of jhana uh, where everything just sort of feels natural. And on a neurological level, part of what's happening is that there is a reduction in, they call it transient hypofrontality. In other words, your egoic sort of self-focus kind of quiets down, which means that, and I experienced this a lot in my writing, it was really a significant hurdle for me to overcome and certainly applies to acting and to music and to a lot of things. Getting that part of my brain that was wondering so much what was going on out of the way so that I could just trust what was coming through me and allow myself to write it, allow myself to play it. Uh, in the case of, say, an extreme athlete, it's the feeling of, and you're in Colorado, so maybe you can relate to this, going down a mountain on your snowboard and you can't stop and think and overanalyze every single turn you're about to take or else you're going to get caught up in it and crash into a tree. These intuitive circuits operate a lot more quickly and getting the uh, frontal lobes out of the way to trust these other parts of our brain to do their job is what's described as the flow state. And it allows for some brilliant creativity, which is my particular area of interest to shine through in this way. Now, generally this happens and this is verified through uh, ongoing studies with EEG. It happens right around that border between the alpha state and the theta state. So in other words, you're aware of the reality that's going on, but you're starting to process things in this different kind of non-sequential, non-linear way. Mm -hmm. And when you allow that to happen, it's a feeling of really something else coming through you. That's where divine inspiration sort of manifests on the page, as it were. Indeed. Um, I... I, I I've come across a definition of flow states, like what actually describes them. Uh, I think you're familiar with this, but the qualities that are associated with flow states are selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, and richness. Mm -hmm. And uh, there could be, of course, a desire to always be in a flow state, but that's not really possible, I think, right? There's a sort of flow between flow and non-flow uh, or mm -hmm. something like that. And, uh, my understanding is you sort of built that into the into the tracks that you've designed. So how do they really kind of work with cultivating flow? Yeah, um, and this was one of the things that really fascinated me too and kind of provided the key to making the Stealing Flow program work the way it does is that flow happens in a cycle which begins with a struggle phase. You... And again, I'm going to use the example of writing because it's what I'm most familiar with. But first, you have to do the hard work of really fighting against something and thinking about it and, and planning and working towards a solution, which is then followed by a release where you let go of the problem, allowing you to drop into this flow state where the solutions and the effortlessness, the timelessness, the selflessness and the richness can all kind of come through. Um, when this happens, the flow state, there is the release of a whole host of neurochemicals. Um, there's anandamide, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine that are all surging through your brain at the same time. And that's part of why this state can be so addictive for folks and why some of these uh, extreme athletes in the beginning were pushing this to to a place of often their own death, um, chasing that feeling. Afterwards, there has to be a recovery, though, too. You need to regenerate your internal neurochemistry. You need to recharge from that before you can re-enter the cycle again. So definitely there's a danger in trying to hold on to it for too long artificially, and the ceiling flow tracks in particular walk us through each of these phases. If you use the tracks in the order that I had uh, initially designed them. It takes you as part of the warm-up track first into a very high brainwave state, way up in the high beta range, which 
correlates with this kind of intense neurological struggle of the struggle phase of thinking about something. And from there, it guides you down through a release into this flow state. Um, and again, neurologically, this is through alpha, right to that alpha theta border where flow happens. After that, there is a recover, release, and recharge track. Mm -hmm. So th th there's, a, there's a way to, uh, maybe what you're suggesting, is there's a way to use the technology, and I don't just mean the tech, like the audio, but also the technology itself of meditation, the whole way that you may structure uh, your, your practice, right, mm -hmm. using, using these tracks, where you could kind of introduce it maybe in the right phase of your, of your creative flow or of your creative process. Uh, you know, for myself and for, you know, all of us, we go through cycles throughout the day when we're more active, when we're more passive, when we're thinking about something, when we're chilling out. Uh, and part of, I think, our work as creative people, right, as writers and artists is to learn our process mm -hmm. and to learn how to, how to, how to, I guess, really work with it because we're all different, right? We have things in common. We have common uh, neurological structures, physical structures, et cetera, culture uh, as well. But we have to learn our process. And, you know, I have gone through a, an ordeal <laughs> to get to the point where I can begin to understand, like, how to take care of my body mind in order to bring myself um, more, you used the word reliably, reliably before. I don't know if I could use that adjective with respect to myself, but to work with states uh, and sort of work with or ach achieve, that might not be the right word either, but access uh, the flow, steal it even sometimes. Um, and in order to manifest what I feel is within me, right? And I think that that is something common to writers, artists, but really anybody who works creatively, a scientist works creatively in de devising a research program, for example, or in um, discerning insights from a, a set of data. So, so we have to like learn ourselves. And it seems that, and my experience has been, I, I'd like to actually talk a little more about our personal maybe experiences, um, that, uh, that it could be helpful uh, to have a tool. Uh, yeah. like this, uh, as long as you can balance it, right? And you don't go uh, t too far. Um, the, it, there's something, there's a bit of humor in the title of your, uh, of your track, Stealing, Stealing Flow. It brings to mind a couple of things, Stealing Fire, like the kind of, mm -hmm. you know, from the gods, as it were, uh, as well as a, a quote that uh, is attributed to Picasso, that good artists imitate, great artists steal. <laughs> and, yeah. and so there is a sort of boldness, I think, in the move to use tech uh, in order to enhance t consciousness. But there's also a, a danger zone uh, there because, you know, it, when we're playing with forces that are uh, in some ways larger than us, right, larger than our egoic selves that we oh, are yeah. operating at in the beta phase, the beta um, phase, uh, we really have to be able to hold that and balance it. And um, like I said, it's, it's even just preparing for this talk today. Uh, I, I used the tracks uh, to do some initial writing, to flesh out my thoughts in a sort of monologic uh, sort of practice uh, session. And sometimes I use it and sometimes I don't. Uh, and sometimes I go through phases of my life where for a few months I'm, I'm not using any kind of tech at all. I'm just doing... Uh, vipassana or shikantaza or noting or some other method of meditation that's raw if you will or natural but then other times i go through more you know phases when i'm when i'm using the tech and um and you, you started mentioning the different tracks that you have mm -hmm. uh there are different use cases right and and even oh, yeah. between like your product stealing flow and then the other products that iwake makes they're kind of designed for different types of ex uh, types of meditation right. uh, so would you want to maybe get a little more detailed about what specifically is in this uh, or is on this album yeah I think one of the things uh, that's important to understand here too is that those are all all the different forms of meditation that you mentioned are really whether you're using an audio track or not are all forms of technology and in 
all of those cases, it's possible to become addicted to it. We've all, you know, heard the stories of the the bliss junkie who just wants to meditate and be in bliss all the time. And it's a real danger for any time you're playing around with a force that is bigger than you and altering your consciousness in this kind of way that you can get attached to it, which of course the spiritual pursuits will try to shield you against. But uh, the danger is there for irresponsible use of it. Um, for flow states, stealing flow in particular, I think there are a couple of things that are really important to keep in mind with it. And one is that creativity and creative states can be so difficult. I'm going to riff for a second on your mention of analyzing data, a scientist analyzing data to try and glean some insights from it um, by talking about Albert Einstein's famous practice of sitting with a problem for a while and then going out to uh, relax on a lake in his boat, just mm -hmm. staring up at the sky. And that's you know a perfect example of what's happening here in the release phase. One of the errors that we make, and Western culture certainly perpetuates this and encourages it even, is that we sit in the struggle phase for far too long without allowing ourselves as biological machines, biological mechanisms to operate the way we should. You know, we need to recover, we need to recharge, we need to release. And I have, I have said a couple of times recently that we can't be all yang all the time. We have to have a balance of these things in order for the full picture to operate the way it needs to for us to express the totality of ourselves. We have to let go. Personally, I have some of my best insights when I'm out on a walk around my neighborhood. Um, I, I live in a beautiful mountain town and when I can step away from the computer to go, and I think this is really important too, is this complete disconnection too, because releasing for many of us in the 21st century means, well, I'm going to close my Word document, but I'm going to mess around on the internet and open 50 million tabs and see what's on YouTube. And that doesn't relax and recharge your brain the way that you need it to. You have to disengage from all of this stuff. And the meditative tech allows you to do that. When you're releasing in that way, you close your eyes and you come to a different place and you can allow your insights then to come into being as your um, your your sympathetic nervous system disengages and your parasympathetic nervous system comes online where these things can start to happen. So one is trying to stay too long in the struggle phase. Another obstacle is, again, 21st century life encourages this, that we expect everything to just be easy all the time, that we don't expect to have to struggle at all. We want to be able to just push the button and have our work magically get done. And Hmm. While a program like Stealing Flow or any kind of meditative tech can be powerful assistant in that process, we work with it because the technology won't force you into anything. It gives you a stimulus that your brain can latch onto and work with it if you do your part and, and work with it and trust the creative process and follow what we've learned about the cycles of flow and allow those insights to come through. Hmm. So I'm looking at the track list here. You have a warm-up track. You have two tracks that are called Stealing Flow. One of them includes uh, affirmations that are mm -hmm. almost inaudible. They're, they're, I don't actually know what they are because I can't hear them. <laughs> um, but uh, you talk a bit about that in the manual, uh, like what the, what's actually being said. And they're positive messages, uh, basically. Yeah. Uh, then you have a track called High Focus uh, and then a track called Breakthrough. So we're still in the Yang. Uh, side of things. But then I think what you're talking about now, the last track is the relax, release, recharge. And this is in training, I more of a, not so much a productivity, right? But the the rest that one needs in the sort of down part of that cycle. Right. That's, that's exactly right. And really the uh, breakthrough track is very much a part of this rest and recovery cycle too. Um, breakthrough is a track that entrains to the mid to low theta state where again, it's, it's normally associated with the REM dream sleep. It's a place of deep creativity where you're kind of disconnected from the outside world. And because of the non-linearity, this is where a lot of insight and creative breakthrough can happen. Um, I use the breakthrough track when I am 
brainstorming plots for books, when I'm thinking about characters and their interactions, when to go back to this uh, scenario of Einstein going out on the boat on the lake, that's really what the breakthrough is for to get you to that place where your brain can just do whatever it needs to do and process all the information that you gathered and worked with in the uh, struggle type of phases. Mm. Um, so you mentioned, I want to maybe shift the conversation just a little bit and talk a bit more about how we personally use the tech. You are an author as well and a musician. And so you use the tech, you create tech, you use it, but then the fruits of it are something a little bit different. Uh, what uh, what you know? What kind of writing do you do, or uh, what what's your kind of life as an author? So this is something that I had wanted to do for a long, long time, and I struggled to figure out what my place would be. Now, one of the miracles of flow states, I mentioned this, uh, getting the egoic self out of the way, the the selflessness of it. Um, put in other words. I had to let go of my attachment to the outcome of what I was doing and just allow myself to write things. So I started out initially just wanting to develop my skills as a fiction author with the ultimate aim and the ultimate love of producing great science fiction that explores sort of some of the philosophical and humanitarian consequences of society and our relationship with technology and our relationships with consciousness and also the way we interact with one another and other things not yet discovered. I love playing with the question of what if. Hmm. Now, in order to get myself there, I needed to, well, first learn how to perfect my craft. And I did that by starting with short stories. And I opted to take the route of an indie author as well. In other words, I decided to publish my books directly instead of even bothering to seek a traditional publisher. And part of the reason for that as well is that I wanted to be able to iterate more quickly and improve more quickly rather than finishing something and sitting on it for months and months at a time. Um, I came across another study just the other day that talked about students in a photography class and they were split into two groups. One group of photography students was told that you're going to get graded on just one assignment for this semester. You submit one photograph and that's it. That's your whole grade. So you produce the very best thing you can. The other group is going to get graded on their quantity of work. You know, if you take 100 photographs, that's an A, 90 is a B, and so forth. So the group of students that had the best photograph at the end of the semester was the group that took more. You know, it's it seems like kind of common sense, but it's not focusing on trying to just create this one great thing. It's the quantity of work that we do that gets us there. So I went the indie author route to write more, more quickly and publish more, more quickly. I went into the romance genre uh, because there was a market for it and because I knew I could learn a lot about how to work with audience expectations and simultaneously kind of surprised myself at times as I learned how to get deeper into this creative writing flow state that some of the messages and themes that I wanted to explore through science fiction anyway ended up coming through in what my uh, romance characters were facing. I was just about to ask if there was yeah. anything between the two. <laughs> there seemed like such disparate uh, genres. I mean, that stuff that stuff needs to get out. And, and I think that too, my characters ended up, you know, both the, uh, I I don't like the terms hero and heroine and getting into all the gendered stuff, but I'm going to use hero and heroine anyway, both the romantic leads, we'll call them, um, ended up being aspects of myself that manifested in different ways through what was coming onto the page. You really can't get away from it. Um, when you're, exploring creative writing at that kind of speed and with that kind of openness in whatever its form. I am presently, uh, very slowly, albeit working on a uh, another, well, my first really legitimate science fiction book. I am, um, without 
talking about pen names or anything. I actually more intentionally bridged that gap for a while too by writing in science fiction romance genres. So I was able to kind of do both, mm. uh, which is just kind of a growing thing too. And um, thinking about tentacles right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's an Octavia Butler novel that I that I read uh, recently where uh, the intercourse happens through these tentacles that come off the the creature's yeah. face. It was really quite. A stunning image. Yeah. Uh, where did that come from? So, some place in the data yeah. range. I, I'm yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, certainly, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, so, so that has been the bulk of my creative practice. Um, I have always wanted to write more nonfiction material too, and have a project that I've been working on. Really, the the seed of this happened over a decade ago at this point, and I've been thinking about it and taking notes and refining my understanding. And I've gone through several drafts now at this point, but uh, sort of a nonfiction book that uses the arc and the characters and the themes of the Harry Potter series uh, as a means to explore Buddhism and, Interesting. and the lessons of Buddhism. Um, so that's still a work in progress. I'm not 100% certain of the publication date on that, but uh, I am currently in the middle of editing yet another draft and oh, and we cool. shall see I, i'm up to just uh, volume two with with my daughter uh so I, with the sorcerer's stone and and, and then chamber the chamber of secrets. of secrets yeah right we've we've actually moved on to lord of the rings so we're gonna think, <laughs> go through that first and then and circle back to uh partly because the first two movies were uh, so disappointing at least for me <laughs> Where mm -hmm. i think i think we'll both more fully enjoy uh, the lord of the rings movies but that's very cool um I, uh, you know, uh, just to offer like my own personal take and bring it back to the, to the tech, uh, specifically with, uh, with um, I mean, I just started using the ceiling foot flow track. So I'm getting used to them and kind of figuring out like, you know, how and when works best for me. Uh, I've used other iAwake tracks to kind of open up spaces or I didn't deliberately intend to do that, but they seem to open up like sonospheric spaces Bases where certain characters might arise, certain images might arise, and they would kind of bring me back there uh, again and again, where in my writing, I would begin to explore those. Uh, and in this case, this is a sort of big lifetime project that I'm that began coming through uh, through I was a beta text tester actually for um for one of these tracks. Uh, so it's um it's really, I mean, to me, uh, there, there is such a profound value uh, that we are able to access when we're not always stuck in the sort of monophasic uh, culture of mental efficiency and egoic uh, achievement. Uh, we need that, right? Like we need to be able to you know, navigate our way in the world and be effective. And that's all a very important uh, aspect uh, of, a, of a life and, and of a practice. Uh, but what, you know, if I might summarize a little bit, like what I think the tech can do when we relate to it in a balanced way is to perhaps accelerate, perhaps enhance, perhaps uh, smooth out, uh, and uh, perhaps also to instigate, you know, by, by creating that dissonance that we might not otherwise uh, really allow or ourselves uh, toward toward growth um, and toward in the larger sense perhaps some kind of evolution or some kind of, of mutations of consciousness consciousness where the visions that we're having as, as artists and as writers and as visionaries begin to take some kind of manifest shape in the world and that's what's um, particularly exciting to me uh, so um, there, but there are other applications as well, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to at least bring into this conversation uh, the concept of integral recovery and mm -hmm. um, the uses of brainwave tech for performance or for health uh, as well. Uh, so could you bring that in, like um, show what, what the connection between recovery work specifically, which is a kind of you know, th therapeutic type work, uh, and the, the state training and entrainment that the tech does? Yeah, absolutely. Um in 
in recovery in general and in integral recovery in particular, um, I'm, I'm the co-host of the integral recovery podcast at uh, integralrecoveryinstitute.com. And we use the entrainment tech there to deepen, well, for a lot of reasons. One is to help deepen our connection to spirit. Addiction is a disease that happens on pretty much every phase of our reality and our existence. And it affects everything from our physical health to our internal emotional health, to our relationships, to our uh, way of being in the systems of the world. And it affects these things on really profound levels. There's often uh, a lot of trauma there that needs to be healed and a complete disconnection from spirit. So we use the tech to help us redevelop or in some cases develop for the first time this kind of connected contemplative spirituality and an understanding of our place in the world. Um, some of us never had it. The brainwave tech can also be used for therapeutic healing, for understanding the parts of ourselves that we have repressed and cut off. This is a, uh, in, in Carl Jung's work and in integral work known as the shadow elements. Um, we can use the tech to help us, first of all, see what those things are and then to begin to heal and integrate them. Um, there's also a lot of times just the rest and physical healing that comes from entering these deep and restful places that can be profoundly healed through working with those states, using the technology to do it. Um, sometimes brains and bodies in that state need all the extra help that they can get. And certainly uh, brainwave entrainment and I awake is a powerful way to do that. Hmm. You know, since we're talking about this, I, I want to bring in, um, mention an article that was recently shared with me. I, I read the first part of, uh, it's called a trauma-sensitive approach to meditation. It was written by Mark Foreman, uh, who is an integral psychotherapist. And uh, insofar as we're talking about, you know, areas where we really have to be very deliberate and careful, you know, with our overall program and with um, our use of uh, tracks like this and meditation specifically, um, I just wanted to mention this because I read I read this blog the other day, and it it definitely brings a sort of uh, I think a wise perspective uh, to how to how one can integrate uh, audio brainwave tech or meditation uh, technology specifically uh, with a, a recovery practice if you're in recovery or working on uh, the more therapeutic side I mean so far as you know we've been talking about perhaps more performance or creative aspects of it but there certainly is a, a powerful I think use case uh, in, in the recovery as well. And in fact, that's how I first came into this because this is more of a personal side of the story. I met John and Pam Dupuy, uh, who founded iWake Technologies uh, by volunteering at the initial integral recovery uh, in, uh, intensive that John did in, uh, in Teesdale, uh, Utah, 10 years ago, uh, actually. And that's how I got to meet uh, them uh, and how we began our relationship, uh, working on the iAwake website and uh, writing as well. I was a um, I s assisted John in writing one of his first papers on integral recovery, and um, so it's been also part of the path that's kind of woven in and out. Uh, and we've talked about our culture and the wider situation, you know, this that we're in. Uh, this. Uh, a, a world that seems to be, you know, on fire, seems to be in a very chaotic, turbulent state. There's something big happening, right, in the larger scheme of things. And uh, and that can lead, you know, many people to, uh, to like, like we've, we've discussed, to really seek escapes and to really seek to self-soothe and to seek to um, protect themselves, you know, against the trauma of just being. Like, in some sense, being itself, being in the world is a, is traumatic. Uh, and then people also have specific traumas that they undergo uh, as children, as adults. Uh, Mark Foreman talks a bit about that in the paper and bringing a sensitivity uh, to that. But um, I guess, you know, I want to make sure to bring this dimension into it too, because part of the practice uh, uh, aspect, as, as I understand that you 
teach it uh, through integral recovery involves these four um, kind of ways of being. One is called waking up, right? Uh, that's the spiritual realization, the transparency to, uh, you know, to the ultimate, however you want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. The showing up, which is like becoming present, right? Like, like we're, showing up, we're showing up here mutually right. in this space, in this conversation. Like we're showing up in the world as actors, as agents. Uh, the cleaning up, right? And that's the shadow work, the therapy work, the kind of yes. getting your act together, you know, like becoming capable even of functioning. Like that's, uh, yeah. and also the moral dimension of it, like righting wrongs and um, pursuing justice and, and practicing ethics. Uh, and then the growing up, which is the developmental aspect and yeah. the ways that in all these different modes, emotionally, intellectually, socially, interpersonally, we can grow. Uh, and um, and so that those all in some ways come together and th those are all yes. pieces of what you're doing. Yes? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, the, the showing up in particular is one of the things that using using the stealing flow for being productive or even getting over your fear can do. You know, I had an issue for a long time of just being too afraid to show up in the world and getting the egoic self out of the way uh, was something that was necessary for me to really be present and take a chance. Um, continue to to show up and be there and face that fear on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that fear for a lot of us is strongly rooted there. Um, yeah. And cleaning up, as you mentioned too, that's not just getting clean, that's dealing with all the shadow stuff that we're afraid to face and using our meditation tracks for that, using the transformative technology as a way to really get in and access that. And we have to also show up compassionately when we're doing that cleaning up work because some of the things that we have been through are really hard to look at and really hard to revisit and there is a degree of self-compassion that's evolved involved in uh, facing some of that stuff so that we don't re-traumatize ourselves in the process or push those things further back into the shadow um, cultivating that kind of compassion involves doing the work in the waking up phase where we deepen that connection and begin to realize our purpose and really why we're all here. Purpose can be a hard one too. If your life has no meaning, then, you know, you might as well keep on using because what's the point if there's no spirit, if there's nothing that matters, if you don't have anything to get up and live for. Mm -hmm. So the practice covers all of that and meditation and using the transformative tech in that way is part of that but there's also equally important in in my opinion and i believe that john agrees is the body practice taking care of ourselves physically through you know right nutrition right sleep especially right exercise and technology can be really helpful there too using the right uh, brainwave entrainment can help you get into that state where you can show up to your workouts and bring the intensity and the commitment that you need to transform your body, heal the damage that was done and grow to a place that is beyond what you ever thought possible. The tech can help you sleep more deeply. It can help you rest and recover when the exercise is done. And all of that fits together and all of that is essential to recovery. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Doug, uh, we're at the top of the hour, and I want to kind of step out of the conversation that we've been having and talk a little bit about what I'm doing here with Infinite Conversations Live and with the kind of larger project of the cooperative, the Cosmos Cooperative, uh, because and part of the reason I wanted to have you on is because I've been working with uh, Pam and John and I Awake, and we've been... Um, you know, we're kind of in a sangha, we're kind of in a meta community uh, with each other of practitioners, of creators, creatives, of uh, people that are trying to, in their own ways, and like through a variety of different projects and initiatives and discourses, um, bring greater healing and wholeness and, and creativity to the world. Uh, I know for me, the, the practice really takes meaning in the context of bringing forth uh, something better something new yeah. something more beautiful 
and also a B of recognizing what's already there because there's uh, we don't have to go looking that far for uh, truth, beauty, and goodness. It, it's it's really um, not just within us but all around us. And so, um, so to the extent that we could attune to that, and I think um, I think uh, we're doing like I, I feel that we're I feel that life is worth living. <laughs> Let's put it that way, yeah. uh, and more than worth living. Uh, we could really bring uh, ourselves to it, and um, and make it more, make it beautiful. Uh, so, so that's what I, that's sort of my project. That's sort of my meta project or the goals or the larger objectives of becoming more cooperative as a society and becoming more coherent, right? So I want to support what you, you all are doing. You have already been supportive of, of what I've been doing. I've mentioned, uh, how, you know, how, um, over the years, John and Pam and the tech has been a part of my life. And so I wanted to have this conversation just to give back a little bit and <laughs> express my, my gratitude and support what you, you all are doing because you are creating this as um, a value that you're offering to the world, right? So you have a website, uh, iawaketechnologies.com, mm -hmm. and if folks want to try the technology and to uh, integrate it into their, into their practice uh, creatively or in any other mode, uh, can you say a little bit more about what you all offer? Yeah, uh, iawaketechnologies.com has a lot of great stuff for you to check out. Um, if you go there, right there on the homepage, uh, you can download, click the button to download a couple of free sample tracks. And there are several different ones there for meditation. We have uh, products for doing the healing work. Um, that are around releasing. There are some for sleep. There are products that can be used for exercise and yoga practices and healing practices like massage or Reiki, uh, et cetera. Um, there's a phenomenal, the flagship product of iAwake is the Profound Meditation Program. And this is probably, and again, I've been using the text since about 2001. I discovered it a long, long time ago. And Profound Meditation Program is hands down the easy the the most effective meditation suite that i've ever used takes you all the way down into the deepest deep delta all the way up into the highest gamma tracks for each of these and just powerfully in training beautifully healing and embedded with a subtle energy that helps the process along the way and really allows for some profound transformation okay so iawaketechnologies.com uh, there's a download the tracks there. Uh, you also have another website at Integral Recovery Institute uh, mm -hmm. org. Is that right? Integral Recovery Institute dot com, and that's where you can find out more about uh, Integral Recovery and listen to the podcast. Okay, excellent. Infinite Conversations is a production of Cosmos Cooperative, a creative co-op for visionary minds. We're a community of writers, artists, thinkers, and conversationalists who are dedicated to cultivating the life of the mind. We host public dialogues, organize reading groups, publish an online journal called Metapsychosis, and produce podcasts like this one. You can sponsor this podcast through your Cosmos membership, which also lets you participate in live events and start your own conversations in our forum. If you're the kind of person who loves diving deep into the living waters of philosophy, literature, art, media, politics, technology, consciousness, and all that kind of thing, and could use a platform that's all about supporting your creative work and intellectual life, then check out the co-op. Visit cosmos.coop to learn more. We'd love to have you as a member. Of course, you can also subscribe to Infinite Conversations on iTunes and wherever else fine podcasts are served. And be sure to sign up for our email newsletter at infiniteconversations.fm, where you can comment on this episode and find other quality podcasts as well. This is Marco V. Morelli signing off. Thanks for listening.